I'm looking at various ideas. Oh, and sorry, we're live now. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, <laughs> welcome, everyone, to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 Advisory Group. And our guest today is Nancy Rubin Stewart. Nancy Rubin Stewart is an author. Actually, she began her career as a writer with the New York Times. And she wrote her first book was on um, suburb new suburban women. And she's also written about the mother mirror. And then she delves his, she has in recent years been delving into history. She's written biographies of Isabella of Castile and Marjorie Merriweather Post. And we're fortunate that of late, she's really been focusing on the revolutionary period. She's written a book about Mercy Otis Warren, a joint biography of Peggy Shippen and Lucy Flucker Knox. And her new book is Poor Richard's Women, Deborah Reed Franklin and the other women behind the founding father, which came out a year ago and as of today is available in paperback. So thank you, Nancy, for joining us. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here. And so uh, you talk about a number of the women and, and Franklin did have a lot of women in his life. And <laughs> yes. I think you say the most important one, of course, is Deborah Reed Franklin, his common law wife. So what interested you about Deborah Reed Franklin? How did, how did you get into this story? Well, I was always curious about their marriage because certainly he talks about in his autobiography that it was a happy marriage. And yet they had two long separations, one for five years and the next one for 10. And he mm -hmm. did not come back in the months he could have when she was dying. Yeah. So I, I, I needed to find out what that was about. Yeah. And he chastises her for not writing. In yes. those last years, no, no, no. do you think he was unaware that she was dying, or didn't want to acknowledge this? I think he was. He did not. He did not understand why she, why she, that she was dying, mm -hmm. and I think he thought she was angry because he kept telling her, "Oh, I'm coming back on the fall ships. I'm coming back on the spring ships," and he never did. Yeah. So uh, he thought he kept accounting for the fact. Um, that she must have been angry and, and wasn't writing. But after a while, after about eight months or 10 months, he, he began to get um, upset why she wasn't writing. And yeah. of course, she wasn't able to. Uh, yeah, she died in December of 1774, a second stroke. She'd already had one some years before that. Yeah. yeah. She was an interesting woman, though. And they had built a house together, which she actually did most of the building in Philadelphia. Yes. He actually, she did because he left. He 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 um, built the house because he, he she was very upset when he came back from England the first time, and he wanted to go back there, mm -hmm. yeah. and she didn't want him to go back there, and, and she didn't she didn't want to go either. He had wanted no, to go and with when him. he was supposed to go as an agent for um, the uh, colony of, of uh, Pennsylvania to plead for the tax for the pens to pay their taxes. Uh, at that point, um, he thought she would go with him when the assembly appointed him to go and mm -hmm. plead with the pens in England and maybe even go to the to the to the uh, privy council and and see what could be done. And he was shocked that she didn't want to go. She wouldn't go, but she was terrified yeah. um, of crossing the ocean, among other things. So yeah. anyway, they had when he came back in 1763. Mm -hmm. Look, she was ecstatic. He had been away for yeah. five years, mm -hmm. and. Um, then is a sort of a they had an argument about it because he wanted to go back and she knew about it and and even her, uh, his son uh, William uh, writes about this that to to placate her he said okay I'll build us a house they'd never owned a house they'd already lived in yeah. rent for many years and so he began to build the house and then the assembly said hey you've really got to go back to England mm -hmm. and yeah. again she refused mm -hmm. and then she was left um, to complete the house. And yeah. you know, colonial women had no, this was not a woman's purview. Right. So right. she, but, uh, and they, you know, she had to deal with uh, hiring carpenters and yeah. plasterers and so on and so forth. But ultimately yeah. she did it. She completed it. Of course, he kept sending letters with instructions. Right. You yeah. Know, yeah. But she did. Yeah. Yeah. So. And then, of course, she defends it during the Stamp Act riots. When well, yes, when the Stamp Act riots started and, and it was misinterpreted that he supported the Stamp Act, which he did not. He was simply obeying mm -hmm. rules that uh, mm -hmm. the powers that be had demanded mm -hmm. um, by uh, appointing a, a, um, a stamp commissioner or, mm -hmm. or a stamp yeah. person to collect it. Anyway, um, a group of, of rowdies, uh, a gang, uh, came and threatened to tear down the house and mm -hmm. she 
she called her brother and a cousin and, and with and got guns. And she, yeah. he was one of them who defended the house with gunpoint. And she later wrote to him, she was sure he hadn't done anything wrong. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah, she was upset with his reputation being attacked. Right, right. And but you know, that wasn't the only thing. She um late early on in their marriage, he trusted her. Ben didn't trust people too easily, as you no. probably know. Yeah. And he um, assigned her power of attorney soon yeah. after they were married and he had to go away. And that wasn't the, the first time. Mm -hmm. He did it again later. Again, unheard of for colonial women. Yeah. Women were home and hearth. That was mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But she was unusual. She was. She was. And then while he is in London and she is still in Philadelphia, he's staying with Margaret Stevenson. And yes. Margaret's daughter has a baby at the same time that um, Sally Franklin has her son. And so yes. the two grandparents are writing about these. Yes. Well, unfortunately, um, he seems to have quotes adopted his English family. Yes. And um, this is a, this is a, a, a bone of contention, if you will, between them. And, and Deborah keeps praising her grandson, yeah. little Benji. And yeah. um, he kind of sloughs that off. And he says, it's your grandson. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's his grandson. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and all he talks about is Sally's, he's godson to this mm -hmm. child, and then soon others. So this had yeah. to be painful, you know. Yes, yes. So what about what about the relationship with the daughter? Because he's very close with the son William, and mm -hmm. until they have the break during the revolution, mm -hmm. I always feel badly for Sally, who's mm -hmm. you know she is kind of ignored by her father. It seems or not as close. Yes, it's um. First of all, when she's born in 1743, he's already a very wealthy man. Yes. And he's already kind of uh, lost a lot of interest in many of his um, possessions and his um, printing business. Mm -hmm. and he has yeah. Someone who's sort of half taken it over. And he's interested in, begins to, to pursue his hobbies, which are experimentations yeah. in science and in particular electricity. So uh, there's, there's that. And then he um, he's always... Um, trying to educate Sally to be thrifty. He even has poor Deborah write to England and say, send books and uh, Sally can learn to sell them. She's still a child yeah. in the store and become thrifty and economical and learn about commerce. And then later there are uh, chiding lessons uh, that he writes to her. He, mm -hmm. uh, she's not, she has to go to church more. Uh, she'd be moral. He's always mm -hmm. uh, asking Deborah to make sure that she's bringing her up properly uh, mm -hmm. To the point where even much later, during the, during the revolution itself, when Sally, who has, by the way, volunteered and got and, and banded together uh, many women in Philadelphia to sew uh, mm -hmm. shirts for the soldiers, uh, and then Washington's having some kind of a celebratory festival at some mm -hmm. point during this, and she writes to her father and she says, would you please send me some feathers and things for my mm -hmm my yeah. gown and yeah. you know he just refuses meanwhile he's already donated to a lottery to win polly margaret mm -hmm. steen's daughter diamond earrings wow um, so you know this is yeah is a very different attitude uh he wants uh sally basically to be a colonial wife which mm -hmm. means not really yeah. very well educated yeah and, and on the other hand he's educating as much as he can through letters and so on we have some of them polly he's answering right. all of questions and he talks with her with a great deal of affection oh yeah yeah and then both polly and sally are there when he dies she well yeah and i would love to know more we have some little hints mm -hmm. that um well um polly becomes widowed and she has three children she comes mm -hmm. over the last decade of his life uh, the last few years of his life and of course sally has by then seven children Yes. And um, she now is the she um, is taking care of her father as much as she can. And there's, mm -hmm. uh, there are accounts from a granddaughter who remembers this mm -hmm. when she's a, a baby, a little a little girl yeah. uh, about him. But Polly comes over and, you know, again, a lot has not been saved, mm -hmm. um, but there had to be tension between these two. We, we know that they were very polite to each other and yeah. proper, mm -hmm. um, but it was Sally. And by the way, Sally is now in her eighth pregnancy. Mm. is doing the heavy lifting right. in terms of her father and the end of his life. He was ill for over a year. Yeah. But Polly yeah. is reading to him from books and so on and entertaining him. So, right. And Sally is doing the work of probably emptying the chamber pots and doing well, that. Well, Sally is doing the work. Yeah. I yeah. know. 
Yeah. Yeah. So um, we should talk a little bit about um, some of the women in France, because this is a, the one story people seem to know about Franklin. And then um, I wonder what truth there is. So Madame Helvetius or Madame Brion, his relationships with the court ladies of France and how mm -hmm. he's using that as, you know, what, what, what's your take on this? Well, you know, he, he, he's not shy about admitting that he loves women. Mm -hmm. um, always had had so there's there's no secret he's had a few little serious flirtations while he was still married to mm -hmm. Deborah in uh, in colonial America. Um, anyway, when he is in uh, has rather newly arrived 1778 in Paris and he moves to a villa uh, through a friend uh, in Ote in uh, nearby and. Mm -hmm. He is introduced to this beautiful. She's supposed to be the most gorgeous woman in in um, uh, in in Pennsylvania, uh, is uh, as Madame Brion. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and she's thirty three. She's married. Mm -hmm. She's married to an aristocrat. She has two children. It's an arranged marriage. It's a loveless mm -hmm. marriage, and she's gorgeous. And mm -hmm. she, uh, is she's such a talented musician. Uh, she uh, is a champion of the new pianoforte. Mm -hmm. uh, Goes to the harpsichord, right? And uh, in fact, she's so famous for her compositions and her performance that uh, even Boccherini uh, devotes a sixth piano sonata. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, they're taken with each other, and there's over a hundred letters between mm -hmm. them. And it's quite a love affair. It's yeah. it's really rather amusing. Um, mm -hmm. And she she sits on his lap in public, and she kisses him, and she calls him mon cher papa. People are a little scan, you know, a little scandalized, although of course in France at that time. Mm -hmm. A lot of things like that. Mm -hmm. Anything went. But um, when it comes to the final favor, which is what he ultimately wants, mm -hmm. she refuses him. Yeah. And he's horrified mm -hmm. and um, and hurt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually this becomes a friendship where she becomes, he's more like becomes the uncle, the avuncular mm -hmm. uh, guide to her behavior mm -hmm. and her sorrows and her mm -hmm. various issues. Yeah, when she finds out her husband's having an affair, she goes to Franklin to console her. <laughs> well, um, so uh, he then admits he's he's she. But the ironical thing is, she wants him, Bob, all for herself. Right, um, right. She doesn't want him to be with other women, and he says, "Look, there's nothing wrong with me being with other women and socializing. I just, you know, basically, you're starved this cherub, which is his love." Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. I need, you know, I need uh, more nurture for this uh -huh. Arab. It's getting skinny. It's not mm -hmm. getting proper love. And so it's a charming letter. So mm -hmm. he as soon is introduced to Madame Helvetius, who's the widow of the philosopher, mm -hmm. Audio Helvetius. And she's a um, famous uh, salon hostess. Yes. She's, she's, she's older than Madame Brion, too. She is. She's quite a bit older. She's, a, she's in her 50s at that mm -hmm. point. Now, Franklin is in his seventies, mm -hmm. okay, uh, and um, he he's he loves the salons because naturally this is where this great intellectual ferment of the philosophers of the mm -hmm. pre-revolutionary France. Uh, many famous people had been there: Voltaire, Diderot, mm -hmm. Cordesay, Houdin, uh, Turgot. I could go on, but I won't. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so he loves that, but he also is taken with her. Now she's an unusual character; she's mm -hmm. not a typical. Uh, she's uh, sort of rebelled against everything that's conventional. She lives in this uh, chateau that she she purchased after her husband's death, uh, which has three single women uh, living with it, three single men who live with mm -hmm. her. Two are mm -hmm. abbeys and one is a medical student, and they kind of keep track of her. She's mm -hmm. a social butterfly, mm -hmm. and she doesn't keep dates. She doesn't write much. They sort mm -hmm. of act as a secretary and sort of, I think they ground her in some way. Yeah. Mm. And, but nevertheless, they have this charming, she and Ben have this charming love affair. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a lot of times he'll go to her. There's some, some letters about this where she, he'll, she'll promise to have him come and have dinner and so mm -hmm. on and bring his grandson. And he goes, he writes, he, he says, uh, I bathed, I clothed, I dressed, I made myself mm -hmm. as good as I possibly could. And I came in my carriage and I got there and, and you were gone. You forgot you had mm -hmm. uh, an engagement in, in Paris and there wasn't mm -hmm. even any much food left for us. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's really, yeah. and so in long story short, um, he proposes to her ultimately. Mm -hmm. And he's very serious about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and she has kind of 
brushed him off with that several times. But mm -hmm. it seems from the letters and the implication and some of the letters on some of the reports from their good friend, the economist Turgeot, um, that he ultimately becomes so uh, almost violent in mm. wanting this this marriage that she um, she uh, flees to Tours um, mm. for several months to uh, let him cool off, as mm. as uh, Turgeot would have said. Um, mm. So uh, indeed, eventually they they become friends. Mm. Um, but um, <laughs> John Adams and and uh, and and Abigail. Um, and visit uh, yeah. and come to, she has one of her, her um, mm -hmm. dinners. And they're horrified at her. She runs over to Franklin to totally without ceremony. She slaps yeah. him on the back and she yeah. she's addressing him in yeah. this very familiar, really disrespect. No, I won't say disrespect, but yeah. they're horrified and they yeah. are horrified at, at uh, her, the unkempt quality of her house with her 18 right. cats running around. And yeah. And her dog that her is dog. well trained and <laughs> yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah. They're just horrified by the whole thing. But this is after Franklin had said, "You're going to meet one of the best women in yeah. France." And he did. He said, "Yeah, this is a real French woman." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he he eventually that is not going to work. He even tries to marry mm -hmm. his grandson Temple, who has been serving as a secretary, mm -hmm. uh, William's son, mm -hmm. um, illegitimate son of an illegitimate yes. son. Um, he even he even tries to marry William to her to Madame Brion, the Brion's daughter. Right, and yeah. that probably would have worked, except Temple was a bit of a rake, and he'd yes. already gotten the a married woman uh, pregnant with another child. Mm -hmm. So the the third illegitimate son of an illegitimate son. Of right. A, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but uh, the the Franklin fault line there disappears mm -hmm. yeah. because that poor child dies. Early. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so so long story short, it doesn't work with uh, Madame Brion mm -hmm. much as he wanted to unite the families, ultimately, and yeah. so he does eventually after the after the truce, after the treaty, mm -hmm. after the mm -hmm. revolution is over, he does go back to uh, Philadelphia. Right, right. We're we're talking with Nancy Rubin Stewart, author of among other books, Poor Richard's Women, Deborah Reed Franklin, and the Other Women Behind the Founding Father, and. You know, we were talking a little bit about um, the Franklin family. He did try to marry off William to um, yes. Holly Stevenson. Yes. And also things might have worked out or might not have. We never know. Um, what about uh, his relationship with his sister, Jane? Yes, I don't uh, do a, a great deal about that in the book because, um, well, my, my publisher really wanted me to more or less focus on his romantic relationships, okay. but he he has a, a, a I'll say a close relationship with her. She's married to a man who's a near do well. Mm -hmm. They have many children, and he tries to take care of the the sons, and set them up various, none of which works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jane is is extremely poor, and he does ultimately provide for her. I think he probably pays off uh, the mortgage in her mm -hmm. house, um, but we don't know a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I, at least I didn't deal a lot and. Okay. Uh, with it, and there, Jill Lepore did a book some years yes. ago on on Jane, uh, his his uh, sister. Yes. Yes. But uh, you know, one thing that always amuses me is they do agree that that the Franklins were a bit miffy. Well, that means they could be pretty argumentative and yeah, and, uh, yeah. contentious. So yeah. I, I okay. think it's interesting. It is interesting. Um, what about he's on a trip back from Boston to Philadelphia when he meets Kathy Ray, who mm -hmm. was Kathy Ray Green, and that's an interesting relationship. Yes. Now he's married to Deborah, and he yes. still has uh, he's he hasn't yet left for the the important first trip to England. The first trip that was he'd been there earlier, but this was yeah. the big trip, and um, he is the um, uh, the deputy colonial postmaster of the America of the American colonies. And he took this all very seriously, and he did a great deal of work to improve the post office, including things like express mail and a dead letter office and right. a lot of other other lot of other improvements uh, that we don't even think about today. But um, he uh, so he was traveling the postal the postal offices uh, north and south of Philadelphia, um, including down in Virginia uh, and elsewhere to to make them more uniform. Is they were all very idiosyncratic. And he went finally to Boston, uh, where, by the way, he, of course, still had relatives. In fact, a brother who, with, who 
who was married to uh, somebody else. And through them, he met um, somebody he was actually related to very distantly through marriage. You know, she he was 48, 40, 48 years of age, uh, almost 49, and she was uh, 23. Mm. And uh, we don't know what she looked like. We don't have pictures, although we do have a picture of her aunt and mm -hmm. she said to look like her. But she, more importantly, she was a very bright, inquisitive mm. woman. And of course, he was by then known as the father of electricity. He had already, right. of course, um, proven um, the importance of electricity as one of the natural elements and in ways that perhaps it could be harnessed. Uh, and he was internationally acclaimed. So he was already a celebrity. Um, and she was dazzled by him. And again, this is they had this, mm -hmm. had this amazing relationship and flirtation. And then mm -hmm. she had to go back to Block Island uh, because her father was ill. That's where she came from. Mm -hmm. And he volunteered to accompany her on uh, back to Rhode Island, mm -hmm. uh, to the shore anyway. And that's at least a two-day carriage ride, perhaps mm -hmm. more. Nobody knows where they stayed. Now, it is true there was a post uh, a driver. Uh, mm -hmm. There was also a, a woman, who, a, a female relative, who went for part of the way, but not mm -hmm. all. And we do have these wonderful letters uh, from them. And, and he... he um, they always talk about, you know, the bad weather and the storm. And it was in December and January and, mm -hmm. and the flirtation uh, that uh, they had. And yet um, it seems as though I don't know where they stayed. And mm -hmm. we know that this trip actually took quite a long time because he took her, he, he took her down to see her sister and stayed. And then they traveled mm -hmm. some more, uh, eventually down to the coast. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know how long, but we know it was several weeks. And um, then apparently somewhere along the line, he wanted to, to, um, to be intimate with her uh, and she, she refused. So there's some letters that come later in which they exchange letters and he writes, you promised me to send me kisses in the wind. And we don't have, he didn't have that letter. And then he said um, that you're, you know, you're, uh, as he watched these snowflakes, they were as pure and white as her virgin bosom. And it's mm -hmm. cold. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, you knew he was he was rejected. And mm -hmm. uh, and yet again, they become friends. In fact, they correspond throughout their yeah. lives. Yeah. And, and, and then and, doesn't Deborah say she will bequeath Franklin to her? Well, to her? Deborah doesn't catch on. I mean, she's very naive. She's crazy about about her husband mm -hmm. and adores him. And she doesn't seem to catch on. I mean, he tells her about about Katie and how interesting a young woman she was and so on. And, and Katie starts sending things like cheeses and, mm -hmm. and so on. When he rides back from that visit with Katie, he lingers for a while in, mm -hmm. um, in New Haven and, and elsewhere in New England. And then he starts to come back and he said, I'd almost forgotten I had a wife and a home. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's completely taken and overcome mm -hmm. uh, by her. And he's, he's, you know, involved in this, this passionate, you know, middle-aged romance. And then Deborah sent, um, uh, Katie sends cheeses and things from mm -hmm. Block Island. And mm -hmm. Deborah is proud of how, how much yeah. you know, this woman adores him. Yeah. And um, she's, she, does, she, uh, she says, she thinks that's great. She dismisses it sort of with a tongue in cheek. Well, he mm -hmm. could, you know, she could have him in a way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but she never gets it and he never tells her. Mm -hmm. He never tells her a lot of other things either. He never tells her, um, for instance, that, um, uh, well, William, 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 well, when they're first married, six months, mm -hmm. he arrives yeah. home with, with this bundle. Yeah. And inside is a baby boy. And he says, here, this is my son, William. Wow. <laughs> says, Who's the mother? And we yeah. still don't know. It's a whole long story. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of things he doesn't tell her. When William has an illegitimate son while he's in England studying law, he never tells he never tells Deborah mm. about it. It's not, and it's only much later. Deborah has passed away. Yeah. When he comes back to um, uh, Temple is is his name. Mm. He comes back many many years later to uh, the, the states. Well, it wasn't the states then to to colonial mm. America. Um, he brings Temple, and Temple yeah. then gets introduced to his real father William. Mm. Right. So there's a lot of things that yeah. Deborah doesn't. No. Yes. We're, we're talking with Nancy Rubin Stewart, author of Poor Richard's Women, Deborah Reed Franklin and the Other Women Behind the Founding Father. And so 
Do you speculate at all on who William's mother might have been? <laughs> well, there are books written on William's, who, whoever it could have been. Of mm -hmm. course, the, the, his enemies, Ben's enemies, jeer and say, you know, this was some kind of a prostitute. And he, right. there are rumors, there are terrible, nasty rumors. And said things like, well, he's made her into a slave and she takes, Deborah has her as a slave. It's all ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's denied, of course, yeah. by people who know better. But one of the theories that I like is that she probably was not a prostitute. Although he does admit that he has spent time with prostitutes. He admits this even in his autobiography, which yes. just That's astounds a, me. Yeah. That somebody the, low, the low women who fell in my yeah. path. Yeah, the low women that, that were, he satisfied his natural urges. That yeah. fascinates me in an 18th century memoir, which is extraordinary yeah. enough in itself. Yeah. But back to um, William. So my, I think, I think J. Leo LeMay, the distinguished scholar uh, mm -hmm. Franklin, um, probably had it more or less correct, which is that this was probably um, and not a prostitute. This was some mm -hmm. sort of a, a a woman of a higher stature. Exactly how much we don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, that he had an affair with, and um, her husband or whatever, whoever it was, was came home from the sea or had been traveling yeah. for months, and she'd had this child. Mm -hmm. She had to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, there's a rumor that there's somebody named Barbara. We we don't know who the Barbara is. No. That, that you know, he kept yeah. her in terrible condition. Yeah. And somebody did inquire when William was grown later with Ben, and the comment was made by Ben's best friend that um, the son of the best friend, that um, this um, that uh, this woman was being cared for by Franklin, but neither neither he nor William wanted anything to do with her. Interesting, interesting. But Deborah then raises William as her own. Yes, well, not happily. Well. <laughs> uh, there are reports from her own family recollections that mm -hmm. she didn't want to do it at first. She balked, yeah, yeah. but out of her quotes, great tenderness for her husband, mm -hmm. she agreed to. And William was a, a tough kind of a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of um, uh, yeah. a lot of uh, mischievous and other things that happened. Mm -hmm. And Ben had a hard time kind of training him. Mm -hmm. um, finally, he he uh, um, William spent a short time. Uh, in military service, but then when Ben went to England, he took him uh, mm -hmm. and had him educated in England as a barrister at the Inns yes. of Court. So William becomes then, you know, it's bright um, mm -hmm. and so on. William becomes then sort of um, the right person for, and he knew the right people, uh, and maybe because of at that time things were good between Ben and, and mm -hmm. the uh, yes. and the British, uh, that Ben becomes uh, at William becomes the um, governor of. Um, of New Jersey, and he, he then marries somebody not who Ben wanted. And by the way, William is already engaged to somebody in, in America, which is yeah. you know, another story. And he brings this woman back and becomes the governor of New Jersey. And as you know, he uh, is always on the British side, tragically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tragically for their relationship. Yeah. It, it's an interesting family in many ways. And, and much of what we know about the 18th century normal life comes because Franklin looms so large and so much is known about him. We can then see into these other relationships. He had other people who were part of this um, circle. Mm -hmm. and it's always fascinating that both Ben Benjamin Franklin and his son William attend George III's coronation, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. William is actually in a more prominent place. He's part of the procession. You know, mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin's up in the gallery watching. Right. right. It's uh, yeah. Um, uh, but De Deborah then um, builds the house, defends the house, and then um, has her decline in the 1770s. Um, what more do we know about? Um, her, you know, Benjamin Franklin looms so large. There must, there are a lot of letters between them. What do we know about Deborah from the letters yeah. she's writing to her husband? Yes, I just want to say before I answer that, Bob, um, the historians have dismissed her for generations, um, and at best they have characterized her as way below him and uh, mm -hmm. ill, ill uh, suited to be his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, that she wasn't educated, she wasn't uh, beautiful, she wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, glamorous. Mm -hmm. She wasn't learned. Well, colonial women weren't learned. Yeah. They were. They went to dame school yeah. at best. Yeah. They did not learn to spell. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm saying that because when you look at her letters, they're just phonetic and they're really yeah. quite difficult to read. You have to read them aloud to understand some of the words are broken in the middle. The spelling mm -hmm. is atrocious, no punctuation yeah. and so on. So, yes, it, compared to his erudite letters and his correspondence, my goodness, it's an yeah. enormous gap. But um, on closer examination of those letters, what you what you get is a, a very uh, lively, intelligent, devoted mm -hmm. woman. And yes. Moreover, um, from some of the, th the things that he did with her, um, such as she, because she's assistant postmistress, yeah. uh, he assigns uh, to well, his substitute, he said, you better listen to Mrs. Franklin. She's mm -hmm. the one who can exchange money. And there were different terms for money. Yeah, yeah. In states and countries. She could do this in a flash. And she was really his uh, uh, financial kind of backbone. Um, yeah. he, he writes about that. And mm -hmm. then places like the American history. Uh, the American Philosophical Society, in their ledgers are many, many notes from Deborah. We know that she was highly involved. When he does leave, finally, for the first time for uh, that trip to England, he um, first he's angry she didn't come, and then finally he agrees. He says, you know, it's a good thing you're staying here because you can take care of my affairs. Right. Yeah. So he had a great deal of trust in her yeah. until she began to fail. At that yeah. point, he removes power of attorney from her much later when she's already mm -hmm. ill. Uh, yeah. That's many years later. So yeah. this is not um, a, a uh, somebody who is ill suited. She, no. she really was sort of a silent, um, I won't say partner, but certainly, well, they call her the deputy husband. Uh, yeah. Yeah. She certainly was. And he admits it in many of his writings that he was lucky he had this woman, that she was thrifty and it was because of her, she became a fortune to him. Right. So right. this, this is not um, what the earlier historians had yeah. painted. And I'm hoping, you know, that in this book, I've been able to show that in a fair way. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. We're talking with uh, Nancy Rubin Stewart about Benjamin Franklin and the uh, women in his life, notably his wife. Um, and it's actually through her that he becomes involved in the anti-slavery movement. Uh, yes. With opening a school for yes. blacks. I wonder, Nancy, if we can talk a little bit about their courtship, how they meet, and then how they do wind up moving in together as husband and wife. Sure. Well, as you know, he ran away from his brothers as an apprentice, didn't like the way his brother was treating him and beating him and so on. He ran away to Philadelphia. And, and he ultimately um, found a job with a cranky printer. Um, and then he eventually, the printer wasn't happy because he, young Ben was living with his rival, who was another mm -hmm. printer. And uh, so he, he finally rented rooms from John Reed, who was a carpenter and a bit of a contractor. Mm -hmm. And John Reed's daughter was Deborah. And Deborah was uh, mm -hmm. probably 16 or 17 at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually he begins to court her. And he says he made, he made some courtship to her. And um, we don't have any accounts from her, but she what we know about her at that time was she was a lively, um, mildly moderate, moderately attractive young woman mm -hmm. um we have only one portrait of her as painted in the 1750s uh when she yeah. was well into middle age and she's moderately attractive mm -hmm. he says it's okay not to have a gorgeous wife because gorgeous wives end up having cuckolded husbands mm -hmm. so he's fine what she does have is a lot of energy um mm -hmm. a lot of diligence a lot of devotion she was mm -hmm. uh, you know a, you know a very moral person and mm -hmm. Um, probably by then she already had some pretty good bookkeeping skills. Her yeah. mother, Sarah, uh, was had her own ointment business, um, mm. salad and ointments and whatnot. And actually Ben eventually advertises them in the Pennsylvania Gazette. Mm. But uh, it, I think that it looks pretty clear that Deborah helped her and must have learned some bookkeeping skills from her. So already mm -hmm. she was, you know, she already had these gifts. So right. He's engaged to her. He's betrothed. Mm -hmm. her. Yeah. And then he has this slippery governor, uh, Sir William Key, deputy governor, if you will, yeah. of Pennsylvania, uh, who promises him all of his, uh, he's going to set him up and he's going to set him up in printing on his own. Mm -hmm. He's going to pay for his passage to England. He's going to help buy his printing equipment for him. Ben falls for this. Yeah. And uh, suddenly he's supposed to go to England. Now, meanwhile, uh, Deborah's father suddenly dies. Mm -hmm. He's only in his 40s, and that Mrs. Reed, Sarah, Deborah's mother, is shocked. 
Mm. Now, Ben is supposed to leave on this ship in November, and this is in the fall uh, after his father had died, Deborah's father had died. And Mrs. Reed says, you know, you're both very young. Um, uh, you know, I think you should wait until uh, Ben comes back and he's established and then mm -hmm. you'll be married. And Deborah, you can uh, just imagine. I mean, yeah. we don't know about Deborah, but he, she's lost her father. Now she's lost her fiance. Right. It's off to England. Yeah. And, and off, off he goes. And he's... Um, <laughs> You know, his younger years, he's, he's pretty randy. Yeah. So, you know, he's rooming with a friend who's abandoned his wife and his child. Yeah. And he's making, um, he makes passes at this this best friend's girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, and we think this is when, even though he it's out of order in his autobiography, this is probably when he began to have his first experiences with, quotes low women uh, yeah. to satisfy his needs. And uh, but Deborah is expecting to hear letters from him mm -hmm. and when he's his progress and he's coming back. Well, of course, I have to say that Sir William Keith turned out to be yeah. nothing, idle promises. William had uh, Ben had to get a job immediately and did very well as a printer mm -hmm. in England. Uh, but he writes one letter only to Deborah, and that mm -hmm. letter is well. I don't know when I'm going to be back. Wow. So wow. Deborah is of marriageable age. And uh, how long mm. is it going to be? Maybe he won't come back at all. Many, right. many, many colonists went to England and, and didn't come back, and yeah. vice versa. So her mother and her friends prevail on her to accept other suitors, mm. and she does. Wow. She finally marries one. Um, his name is, uh, he's a potter, John mm. Rogers. And I guess he was a pretty good potter, but he was also a pretty good liar. Mm. So it turns out that within a couple of months of that marriage, she married him in uh, August of 1725. It turns out that Mr. Rogers is married. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so Deborah, that's the end of it for Deborah. She won't take his name. She won't be with him. Meanwhile, he has her dowry. Mm -hmm. Wow. Which he is legally has. He's still yeah. married to her. Getting a divorce in colonial Pennsylvania, even in yeah, Massachusetts, yeah. was exceedingly rare and difficult. So he was was he married somewhere else? In England, in England, he was in England. an English emigre. But yeah. friends said, "Let her know that he knew he was." Wow! So off she was and um, went went back and is living with her mother. Mm. And he meanwhile has her dowry, which he's in uh, this Potter yeah. business. He squanders it. He falls into debt, and within another year, he's run off to uh, Barbados with mm. one of somebody's servant. I don't know who wow. was. And then rumors come back that he's he's been killed in a brawl. Mm. But uh, rumors. So yeah. she's neither single nor married. Wow. She's the odd woman out. Ever her friends are getting married and having children and so on. Yeah. She's mm. nothing. Wow. So she, when Ben does finally come back 18 months later... He finds her to be a totally changed person. She's yeah. she's sad. She's antisocial. She's mm -hmm. angry. She's sullen. She's probably helping her mother with her business because she's yeah. there alone. And um, but he doesn't court her. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, instead he sets up eventually his own printing business in due time. But he he courts other women. Yeah. Uh, and there are a lot of stories about that. And mm -hmm. but he does each of these women. Each of these women. Uh, maybe they they there was more than, you know, some mm. kind of romance. But when it came time to ask the fathers for their hand, they all refused. Mm. Why? Because printers made for poor providers. Right. It's kind of ironical, but anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's move forward to 1730 now. Okay, he's been home for four years. And finally, and he does see the, he does see, because he lived there for, for a while, the reads, he does see the reads before that from time to time. But 1730, in the, in the summer, when he now is the sole owner of the printing business, he started with a friend, he goes to Mrs. Reed and he says, you know, I feel guilty about Deborah. And she says, well, it's not just your fault. And he says, mm -hmm. this is to her credit. He said, you know, I encouraged mm -hmm. him to get married. So the next thing we know, because Ben always glosses over these high emotional moments in his life, he just runs through them in a very mm -hmm. cursory way. He says, so I took Deborah to wife on September 1st, 1730. Yeah. Well, what did that mean? That meant they, they lived together. They yeah. couldn't get married. 
not in a church. So it's a common law marriage. Yeah. yeah because when, she's married and can't prove she is not. And then the Reeds think maybe he married. I mean, they had an experience with a guy being married in England and then marrying here. So they were kind of wary about what he had done. Could he prove he hadn't married someone in England? So yeah, yeah. it is a common law marriage. But then he says we um, thereupon uh, set upon to make each other happy or strove yes, to make strove, each other we happy. We strove to get, yes, yes. We strove we together to make each happy and we strove together. And indeed they did. They became yeah, a yeah. great team. She yeah. immediately um, takes over his uh, rather rather unsuccessful stationery store and turns it into a general store and, and yeah. gets goods from all the wharves and the countryside mm -hmm. and, and becomes one of the leading kind of, there was a small group of entrepreneurial women in Philadelphia, business women, mm -hmm. uh, all, all to conduct it, of course, from their homes, yeah. um, not stores generally. Mm -hmm. um, and she... Um, assists him wherever she must in his, his new publishing business. And within six months, she has to take care of this baby, mm -hmm. uh, William. And um, she, she is a great help to him and they do very well. In 1737, he becomes the clerk of the assembly. Um, mm -hmm. He soon becomes the printer for the assembly. So, and then it goes on. Of course, he has the Pennsylvania Gazette. Now he, she does have, does uh, have a child of her own in mm -hmm. 1732, Frankie mm -hmm. Francis, uh, yeah. who the, they adore, the Franklins yes. adore him. And they have a little portrait done of him when he's mm -hmm. only about three. And they, she even had, Ben even starts to have him tutored before the age of three because mm -hmm. he's very bright and charming. Yeah. Now smallpox is raging. Mm -hmm. Ben of course is always putting articles in the Pennsylvania Gazette about the people who've had variolations or inoculation, mm -hmm. well, it wasn't inoculation. It was a scratching of pus from yeah. one person with smallpox into the arm or the mm -hmm. trunk of somebody else. And um, he uh, he's always saying it's very important to have everybody variolated. Now, he must have had smallpox earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. Deborah must have. William must have. Or they had the variolation. I don't know. But they mm -hmm. weren't sick with it. So Frankie is now almost four mm -hmm. and wants to inoculate or variolate him. And he cannot because little Frankie has dysentery, terrible disease. Mm -hmm. And he, so he cannot, he cannot mm -hmm. get him protected. And Frankie dies mm -hmm. just, before his, or just after his fourth wow. birthday. Wow. So, of course, this jeering afterwards and all kinds of awful rumors. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's because you did variolate him that he mm -hmm. died. You know, it's, you know, there's a lot of superstition right. about as there is yeah. today about uh, mm -hmm. protection from diseases through inoculations mm -hmm. or, or some kind of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. transfer yeah. of the virus, um, which a heartbreak for Ben for the rest of his life and Deborah. And Deborah yeah. displays that portrait prominently yeah. in the house. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not for another seven years that she does not have a, another child. Wow. And historians scratch their heads about that. Mm, yeah. Ben himself has did a study on population increase in the colonies right. compared to England some years later, but he's already made notes that the average and, and you know, Ben was a scientist, yeah. was an early scientist, a um, natural philosopher. Mm -hmm. And he does note that the general, the average births for colonial women, married colonial women, were eight children. Yeah. Deborah has none for those yeah. seven years. Yeah. Which which leads historians to say, oh, well, why didn't she? They didn't like each other anymore. Mm -hmm. There's all this mm -hmm. yeah. misogynist, if you will, commentary, mm -hmm. some of which has even been recently written about mm -hmm. uh, and published. Um, mm -hmm. But my theory is that, and they say, well, maybe she was just working so hard she couldn't be bothered having another child, so on and so on and so on. Uh, we don't know, but mm -hmm. I believe that more than likely uh, because of some indications later um, that she probably had stillborns or miscarried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know. Um, that would seem to be more logical yeah. than anything else because it isn't that he doesn't like her anymore. He no. writes this praiseworthy oh, song. Yeah. I, 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 I sing my plain country Joan, yeah. uh, which was preserved, uh, which he yeah. presented to the Masons. Um, and he celebrates her thrifty and her... her yeah. 
you know, all her, her um, how she relieves him of burdens and right. how she's a great helpmate. So yeah. it doesn't seem no, like... It doesn't, no, and, and poor Richard's almanac, a lot of those little squibs are about trusting your wife and uh, you thrive with a wife and all. So, yeah, yeah. so, and that wonderful song you mentioned about plain country Joan and, yeah. So, so yeah, so it's a fascinating story. We, we've been talking with Nancy Rubin Stewart about her new book, Poor Richard's Women, Deborah Reed Franklin and the other women behind the founding father. And I'm really glad in the book that you do highlight Deborah because hers is really the central story here. And you do wonder, you know, as you said, when he was courting other women printers, that wasn't thought to be a good profession, but it could be she helps make him a successful printer in Philadelphia and allows him to then retire when he's in his 40s to devote himself to other things. So um, anything, I mean, we've covered a lot. We want people still to read the book now available in paperback. Anything else we should say before we let you go? Nancy? Yeah, just, just one more thing. Um, we have this image of him as this man, ultimate man, ultimate reason. This is the, this is Dr. Franklin, the discretion and all the things that you read in, in um, poor Richard's almanac and all of the other proverbs and maxims, everything is about caution and you must use your brain and not your heart and you and you must use logic and reason never emotion and you know this is our image of him this is a man who's ultimately in control but if you read his letters and if you some of them are in the book you'll see this is not true this is a man in some conflict continually oh, yeah. um this is a very human person you know so you know my theory was you know he talks a lot about passion and prudence and so on mm -hmm. and so on my theory is this is a man who struggled with passion and prudence. I, I think that, um, you know, another one of his favorite sayings was, you know, if, um, if emotion drives, um, let reason hold the rein. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think that there are many times in his life that reason did not hold the rein and passion went out. Interesting. Interesting. Which is what makes him such a fascinating character. So thank you. We, we've been talking with Nancy Rubin Stewart, author of Poor Richard's Women, Deborah Reed Franklin, and the other women behind the Founding Father. And I want to thank, thank you for joining us, Nancy, again. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And we will, um, yeah, I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, and also thank some of our listeners. You know, when we started this and you were on with us, well, yes. early on. We thought we'd have a handful of folks in and around Boston listening, but actually we have people all over. So today I'd like to thank our listeners in Hamilton, New Jersey, and Anaheim, California, and in Franklin, Tennessee, and Franklin, Massachusetts. How about that? Philadelphia, um, Edinburgh, Paris, both places Franklin visited, Huntington, West Virginia. I don't think he ever got to Huntington. Uh, and Barachos in Sao Paulo and Delhi in India. Thank you all for listening and folks in all places between. And send Jonathan Lane an email, jlane at revolution250.org. If you'd like one of our Revolution 250 refrigerator magnets or other stuff, or if you have an idea for someone or something you'd like us to talk about on the podcast. Thank you all. And now we'll be piped out on the road to Boston. <laughs>